We can use the equation that we just derived to actually do some numerical examples. So for example, let's think about a situation in which the fitness of that capital A, A homozygote is, say, 1.5, the fitness of the heterozygote, 1.0, the fitness of the other homozygote, um, 0.5. So this is a situation in which the capital A allele is obviously kind of better, right, because those homozygotes do better than homozygotes for the lowercase a allele. And actually, we can think of the capital A allele um, as advantageous, right, because individuals with it do better than individuals without. And it's also um, co-dominant because having one copy is not as good as having two copies, right? The heterozygote is intermediate between this homozygote and this homozygote, so those alleles are co-dominant. Or another term for that is um, they're additive. And then the lowercase allele would be deleterious, right? Because having one or two copies of that allele results in lower fitness than if you have none. It's also co-dominant because having one copy does reduce your fitness somewhat. Um, or also we term this additive, right? If the lowercase allele was recessive, then this fitness would be the same as this. If the lowercase a allele was dominant, then this fitness would be the same as this. Um, and so one of the confusions that often comes up in this course is students have a very hard time keeping track or keeping straight the difference between advantageous and deleterious. And that you determine from comparing the fitness of this homozygote to the fitness of this homozygote. And that you need to distinguish from recessive, dominant, or co-dominant additive which is based on the fitness of the heterozygote relative to the two homozygotes. Okay, so we have this scenario, the capital A, A allele is advantageous and co-dominant. Let's start the population off with some sort of frequency of the capital A allele. And then we want to know after one generation, if this is the starting frequency, what would these be after one generation? So the very first thing that we want to do is we know that we're going to be using um, some equations later that are going to have p's and q's. The very first thing to do is to figure out what q is. And so q is given by 1 minus p, 0.4. So we have p of 0.6, q of 0.4. So now to figure out the new frequency of p and the new frequency of q, or the new value of p that represents the frequency of the capital A allele, the new value of q, which represents the frequency of the lowercase a allele, we need to use our equation from before in order to figure out what is the change in the value of p. That's given by pq over w bar, p w11 minus w12 plus q w12 minus w22. That's our starter equation. And now we can actually just plug these numbers in and we'll be able to get an actual numerical value for delta p that will tell us how this changes. So we could plug in 0.6 for p, 0.4 for q. Come back to w bar in a second. p is 0.6. w11 is 1.5 minus 1.0, that's w12, plus q. W12, 1.0, minus W22. So we can simplify the top part there. It becomes 0.24 over W bar. This becomes 0.5. So we have 0 0.6 times 0.5 plus 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Zero point six times zero point five is zero point three. Point four times point five, point two. So if you 
add this, that's 0.5 times this, you'll get 0 0.12 over w bar. So now we need a numerical value for w bar, which I've kind of been saving. Remember, that's the weighted average of these fitnesses. So w bar was p squared w11 plus 2pq w12 plus q squared w22. So plugging those in, 0 0.6 squared times 1.5 plus 2 times 0 0.6, 0 0.4 times 1.0 plus 0 0.4 squared, 0 0.5. When you work all that through, you get a value of about 1.1. So that 1.1 would go there. So let's represent that on our next sheet here. So delta P that we've just calculated, 0 0.12 over about 1.1, and when we plug that in to our calculator and work it out, we end up with a number of about 0 0.1091. So what does this mean? Delta P is 0 0.1091. That means that we had our starting value of P, which was 0 0.6, and our starting value of Q, which was 0 0.4. 0 0.6 has now changed because of the delta P. So the new value is 0 0.6 plus 0 0.1091, 0 0.7091. The value of Q has now changed, and delta Q would represent the change of that. And delta Q, if we think about it, if P gets bigger, Q must get smaller, and vice versa. So that's actually equal to negative this. So you would have this. and they don't add up perfectly because we have a little bit of rounding error. But we can see that our starting frequency of 60% has now gone to 70% after one generation of selection. And our starting frequency here, 40%, has gone down to about 30% after one generation of selection. Now if we were to redo this with different starting frequencies, what if we had P, what if P equal to 0 0.9? and q equal to 0 0.1, but with the same fitnesses. When we do this, delta P ends up being about equal to 0 0.045 over 1 1.4, 0 0.0321, and so the 0 0.9 changes to 0 0.9 plus 0 0.0321, 0 0.9321, 0 0.1 changes to 0 0.1 minus this. And that's interesting, so these are the same fitnesses, but if the frequencies are different, the change in the value of P due to selection is actually much smaller, right? It's about 3% instead of 11%, even though the fitnesses are the same. And that gives us an interesting result um, if we think about for this set of fitnesses, right, the 1.5, the 1.0, and the 0 0.5, If we were to plot delta P that we would expect versus the actual value of P that we're working with, at 0 0.5, we end up getting um, this 0.1091. At 0 0.9, we end up getting this kind of 0 0.0321. So if we think about like a data point there and a data point there, it turns out that when you actually plot this, you get a curve that looks like this. 
telling us that delta p, this is kind of like our rate of evolution, right? The change in the frequency is the highest when the frequency is at 0.5, and it's the lowest when the frequency is low or when the frequency is high. And what that means is if you started with a very low value of p, the initial delta p would be small. When you get to a large, an intermediate value of p, the rate of change is the fastest. And then as you get to a large value of p, it slows down again. So that's something that looks like the following. If we were to plot the value of p over time from a very small value, at the beginning, it's going to be changing kind of very slowly over time. But now as it's getting more and more common, that rate of change is increasing. So let's put a value of 1 there, and 0 here, and 0.5 here. So that rate of change will be increasing and increasing. And in fact, that rate of change here is the maximum when the value of p is 0.5. After p gets larger than that, it'll start slowing down, because right, delta p is now declining, and you'll get something more like this. And so in fact, we can kind of look at a few zones of change here. At the beginning, this is essentially a slow rate of evolution. Right? The value of p is changing not by much. These intermediate values, now delta p is larger, the frequency of p is changing more quickly. This is like fast evolution. And then we have slow evolution after this. The interesting result from looking at this is that the rate of evolution, which is something that's kind of a fundamental idea that we're interested in, the rate of evolution is maximized at p is equal to 0.5. And p of equal to 0.5 is really another way of thinking about that's when the variation is the highest, right? If you think about what a population looks like, p of 0.5 means both alleles are equally common. That's the maximum amount of variation you can have in your population, right? Over here, most of the alleles are lowercase a. Over here, most of the alleles are um, capital A. There's not as much variation. Right in the middle, or right in the middle, when you have the highest genetic variation, that's when you have the fastest rate of evolution. And in fact, we saw this a little bit before when we thought about the breeder's equation. And so there's this idea that the rate of evolution is proportional to the genetic variation. Right? And when you have more of it, you have a faster rate. This kind of idea here, that the rate of evolution is proportional to the genetic variation, where more variation gives you a faster rate of evolution, this is called Fisher's, that's our guy from the modern synthesis, Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. So this kind of numerical example we just did here is just kind of illustrating the general process. More sophisticated mathematics show that this is a general process that occurs across a wide range of different formulations, but the basic result here holds. The more genetic variation a population has, the faster its response to selection, and the faster its evolution in response to selection will be. So the amount of genetic variation in a population is therefore and the most important thing for us determining its ability to evolve in response to other organisms or to environmental change. And this is one of the reasons why when we're thinking about endangered species, for example, and we're doing conservation genetics, the amount of genetic variation in those endangered species is of primary importance because that's going to determine their ability to evolve in response to diseases, or to climate change, or to environmental degradation. So you may have heard that a lot of times we're focused on genetic variation in endangered populations, and this is why. We want them to be able to evolve in response to whatever challenges them in the future.